Um, I'm so excited to be all here today and to be sharing this panel with such amazing speakers. Um, each speaker is doing really interesting and innovative things in different areas of the supply chain. So I personally am really excited to hear more about what each of them are doing. Um, joining us today, we have Peter from Piper's Farm, which is a 50 acre permanent pasture farm in Devon. Peter is now also running an online marketplace um, called Piper's, which um, sells sustainably produced meat, dairy and grains. Um, Peter has been integral in setting up a mobile abattoir project. So he's going to be giving us insight into processing from the perspective of livestock. Um, we also have Emma, co-founder of Southwest Fibre Shed, who has been fronting a project creating a regional map of textile producers in the UK and will be giving us an insight into the textile supply chain. Uh, also joining us, we have Rupert, founder of Torthy Tier Bakery in Wales, uh, which is a closed loop system growing, milling and baking heritage grains. Um, Rupert's going to be delving into processing from the perspective of grain. And then we also have Adam, co-founder of Wild Press, which is a startup committed to partnering with regenerative orchards and growers to source, press, um, source and press heritage apples. So it should be really rich ground for quite a diverse um, conversation with all these different perspectives of processing in different areas of the supply chain. Um, we're also going to have 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you do have any questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll select a few at the end. Um, I just want to give some reverence to the land that we that we're all on, which is why we're here today. So just to give context of where we all are, um, Peter's based in Devon, Adam is in Buckinghamshire at the moment, Emma's in Stroud in the southwest, and Rupert is in Transylvania. Um, I'm currently in Yorkshire. So just to bring a bit of awareness and reverence to the land that we're each on today. Um, and then also just to give you some context into what led me to reach out to all of these speakers um, and to discuss what is quite still quite a niche topic. Um, I started my food business, Natural State, with my mum 10 years ago. And our motivation for starting Natural State was that we realised that there was very little transparency in food. So we set out to transparently source ingredients for our range of raw chocolate brownies and quickly realised how complex supply chains were. Um, we realised that if we wanted to source transparently, we would have to go back to source and work directly with farmers. So I spent the following five years uh, travelling all over to try and source these ingredients directly from farmers. And as I travelled to Spain and Sri Lanka, um, and Central America, I realized that the common inhibiting factor preventing direct, direct trade was processing. Um, and I'm sure many of you know, but in every area of our global supply system, processing is a really integral part to creating a system which is more just and localized. So with that idea of localization in mind, I'd love to hand over to Peter, who's been localizing meat supply through his farm and distributor Piper's Farm. Um, Peter, could you tell us more about Piper's um, farming and sourcing model, and perhaps also just give people an overview of the meat supply chain as it stands in the UK and how Piper's are doing things differently? Thanks, Jess, very much indeed. I it's so interesting to hear you talking about the driver for you and your mum to start and, and it's about transparency. And I think for us, it was exactly the same. I was involved with uh, my father on uh, industrial chicken production on the small farm I had been brought up on in Kent. And at that time we had two very young children and it struck Henry and I that here were we as young parents producing food that we were not happy to feed to our children. And we were doing it in a way which if consumers really understood what we were doing, they would probably be very reluctant to buy it. So we were driven to start a business quite simply to produce food we were happy to feed to our young children and to do it in a way where we were happy 
to ask our customers at any stage to come and, and look very closely at what we were doing. The difficulty perhaps was that it was meat we were choosing to go into. We were livestock farmers. And I sometimes think we were talking a bit earlier about Riverford and that is an amazing model. And Guy started Riverford a couple of years before we did in about 1987. And over the, the early years, I sort of watched as he was pulling vegetables out of the ground and putting them into a box and delivering them. And I thought, gosh, how nice and simple that is. Because of course, processing animals is relatively complex. And it'll be great to hear from, from all the other speakers about their particular uh, products and, and the different structures that are involved. But I think meat is probably the most complex in the food supply chain. And not least the difficulty has, was caused in the early 90s by BSE. So suddenly meat became a, a really um, dangerous uh, threatening sort of nuclear material almost. Instead of being food, it was then being looked upon as something very dangerous. And at the same time, the UK were trying to adopt EU regulations and it was a perfect storm. So it meant the smaller scale artisan producers were being hit with enormous volumes of really inappropriate regulation. Um, later today, we've got a session about abattoirs where we're going to focus on hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel. We're gonna to start to get some of that regulation off our back. But the point is we need, like you say, absolute transparency. When one of our customers puts a piece of meat in their mouth, they know that through us, they can understand the whole story. Those families on the top of Exmoor who maybe for five or six generations have been breeding native breed cattle, those families are benefiting from the money they have spent to buy that piece of beef. And those animals have been treated with enormous respect all the way through the supply chain they come down off Exmoor to another link in our chain, which is a finishing unit on forage only. And then crucially, cattle, sheep and pigs killed through the small local abattoir. And that link is absolutely critical if we are going to retain absolute integrity and transparency integrity so that our customers really genuinely can trust and respect every mouthful of the food we're selling them. So the links in that supply chain in meat are complicated, but it is critical that every link is as strong as every other link. And that really is what Piper's is about. We now have a, a jigsaw of 40 family farms feeding in to this very robust chain link, which involves the processing and then dispatch direct to final consumers through our online retail platform. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, I'm finding it really inspiring what you're doing at Piper's and I'm also really excited to hear about the development of the mobile abattoir project. Um, also to hear about how Piper's is a collaboration between farmers and businesses, where it, which is where I think there's really like a fertile ground for change. Um, Emma is also from the Southwest Contingency and has been mapping out processing of textiles in the UK. Um, not surprisingly, and what I'm starting to realise more and more from having conversations with these speakers is that there seems to be very similar issues in processing in textiles and food. Um, Emma, could you please tell us more about textile supply chains, what they currently look like in the UK and how Fibershed is doing things differently? Hi, yes, thanks Jess. Um, so I founded Southwest England Fibershed in 2015. 
uh, more or less the same time as starting Bristol Textile Quarter, which is a co-working space for people working with textiles and fashion. Um, Southwest England Fibre Shed is an official regional affiliate of um, the global fibre shed movement, which uh, at this point I think has close to 50 different affiliates who are all working to develop bioregional systems for fibres and fashion that are regenerative and that they nourish the people, communities and the landscapes involved in the production of those textiles. So in short, um, a garment that's produced according to the fibre shed model is 100% natural. Um, it's non-toxic and it can safely be returned to the soil through composting at the end of its life, leaving no plastic microfibers or petrochemical residues of any kind. It's also been um, produced within a fair and equitable system where every person and process is valued properly. Um, and speaking to that, I think that's something that we've discussed in Fibre Shed is that a supply chain, um, the kind of the linearity of a supply chain perhaps doesn't lend itself to thinking about um, production processes more equitably and we should instead be thinking about supply networks. Um, more on that. Um, so all affiliates look a little, little different. So there's no blueprint for what a fibre shed affiliate is, but in the Southwest, um, the way that we've started is by mapping the growers, the processors, the brands, the um, tutors, the workspaces, anybody who's working with natural fibres in some way across the Southwest. So we're starting to get a picture of what this network looks like. Uh, and last year, we also made a short film that was shown in various places. Um, it premiered at London Fashion Week that sought to, I think, bring to light really the voices and the faces behind some of the fibres that are being produced in the UK, which is a limelight that often tends to kind of go towards the design or the brand, brand end of the supply chain. Um, and we've also recently completed a piece of research to map our fibre processing infrastructure across England. Um, which has brought to light some interesting points. So it's kind of broadly speaking, um, well, I'm going to speak mainly about wool process processing infrastructure simply because wool is our primary natural fibre in the UK. We do have emerging industries for plant fibres. I know some have been discussed already in the conference. Um, they're currently under exploration, but we don't yet have a commercial mill for processing plant fibres that is accessible to producers. Um, so decades ago, much of our textile industry was offshored, leaving us with big facilities that are catering primarily to a global market. And that includes um, processing a lot of imported fibers from Australia, from New Zealand, from South Africa, um, including Merino. We also have a handful of small mills that are geared towards working with British fibers, and in some cases direct with farmers but accessing this kind of value added processing can be expensive. It requires a big capital outlay of the producer. Um, we have to deal with long lead times, for example, at the moment to process an organic um, batch of fleece through an organic certified facility, we might have to wait for up to two years. There are very few mills which are so vertically integrated to be able to offer all services under one roof. Um, and by that, I mean, the scouring or the cleaning, the carding or combing that's required before spinning, then the spinning, um, at which point you have a yarn, and then that yarn could either be knit or woven into a finished cloth or garment, um, which they meant may then require dye dyeing or another kind of finishing. So a producer who wants to create a kind of um, an end product may find themselves having to piece together what at this point has become a very complex supply chain um, and then, of course, be able to market it to an end consumer. And we're looking at something that could be relatively expensive um, compared to a high street garment. Um, all said, it can be very off-putting to many farmers to have to kind of negotiate um, all of this. And it's led to a big loss of wool from our homegrown fibre and fashion economy, um, whose potential is not be, being harnessed at all. The alternative, of course, is selling direct through British Wool, which used to be the British Wool Marketing Board. Uh, they provide a really important service that aggregates fiber currently from about 35,000 producers across uh, the UK. 
they have the expertise to be able to grade that into quality consistent bales um, appropriate for large commercial buyers. The downsides, which have been well publicized recently, is that those prices are very much determined by global markets and at times can fall below the cost of producing them, pr producing the wool in the first place and shearing it off the sheep. Hence the stories of many farmers choosing just to burn it and be done with it. Um, the aggregated model also hasn't historically facilitated um, uh, any transparency on provenance, although British Wool has been piloting last year um, a farm traceability program. So we're hoping to be able to see that change. But that's a kind of, that's the general picture. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, I'm really excited to hear more developments um, with the mapping project. And it just feels like we're just seeing so many of the same issues in textiles, grain, um, meat. So yeah, I'm really excited to hear more about that mapping project and to delve more into um, what a processing model of wool could look like later on in the conversation. Um, just over the border from you in Wales, uh, Torthy Tier Bakery is an example of a closed loop system, growing, milling and baking heritage grain. Um, Rupert has been shortening the supply chains of grain um, through the process of, of grain. <laughs> um, Rupert, could you share more about what you're doing at Torthy Tier and how you're doing things differently to the current grain supply chain in the UK? Well, thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, I'm out in Transylvania, actually, at the moment. I'm um, founder of the Tier, but uh, we, my wife is Lithuanian, so we're, we're in between Transylvania and Lithuania now. The community have taken taken the Tier on. Um, yeah, but we've, I founded it back in, um, well, we got things started in 2015, um, and the bakery was finally built in 2019. Um, and, um, yeah, we're a peasant bakery, it's on Boulanger, and um, uh, I learned pretty much everything um, uh, from France. Um, the model Paison Boulanger in France, peasant baker, it means that you grow mill and bake yourself. And in France, there's the key advantage that you you pay the tax of the farmer, not the baker, which is a lot less. Um, but there's, uh, there's no such advantages in the UK on the tax front. But um, yeah, so the model <clears throat> briefly is that you grow, if you're a peasant baker, you grow generally um, um, an evolutive uh, winter population of heritage wheat. So um, that's a mixture of varieties. There are winter varieties that are tall strawed heritage varieties, normally free thrashing varieties. Um, and it's an evolutive population because it's always evolving every year, cross pollination and adapting to the, you know, the, the local uh, bioregion that it's growing in. And so there was in the Tortha Tier population called Hengamaro, a Lithuanian variety of rice as possible. Um, and that includes um, you know, growing with the diversity that's native to the field. So um, you know, all the weeds, uh, so-called weeds, um, and um, <clears throat> And then um, harvesting and, and processing that. Um, last year we grew about 25 acres. Um, and um, and uh, we have an electric powered stone mill there at the bakery, an Astro mill, again, French made. Uh, it's a wonderful mill. Um, and um, it's all a kit, it's the scale for, for the baking. So the baking, um, the oven would take about 80 kilos of bread in, in one firing, and you could do two of those in a day. So give you some idea of the scale. The dough would all, always be made by hand in a dough trough, and it's always sourdough. Um, so, um, yeah, peasant bakeries are always wood-fired ovens as well. So our oven was a wood-fired oven. Um, a method <coughs> in France. So, um, yeah, so that's the model. Um, in terms of processing, like, yeah, there were some key hurdles that we had to overcome because, um, one, you're probably all familiar with Vetch. I know Peter will be. Um, and vetch very much likes growing with the seed. Now, some of the seed I got from France had a tiny bit of vetch in it. So it was never going to be eradicated unless we put it through a color sorter, which we didn't have access to um, because we're very rural in you know, West Wales and Pembrokeshire. So, um, and, um, uh, so what we had to do in the end was import a, um, um, a, um, a three alveolaires, as they call it in France. And it's kind of, I'm going to put a link in the chat now which hopefully will work for those, those of you that want to see it. It's a little video, it links to my Google photo, so I'm hoping it'll work for you. Just a, a little demonstration of the wheat um, going through that machine when it was in the shed a few years ago, uh, when we first uh, got the motor on it, and it'll give you an idea. Um, but um, basically the problem with the vetch uh, in our case is that if you put it through the, the tray cleaners that you, many of you have probably seen that most farms use, um, 
they will separate out um, a lot of other weeds, but, but vetch tends, because it's the same size, will roll off the wheat uh, with the wheat. And so um, the indented cylinder you know, allows, allows the vetch and the wheat to fall into the, into the indents, but then there's a plate on the inside that will knock, uh, knock the wheat out and take the vetch out separately and separate about 98% of the vetch if you're running it, running it well. But they're old machines, they're made in the 1940s, um, these ones, um, but they didn't cost a huge amount. It was about 600 euros to buy it and another 600 to get it uh, shipped over to Wales. But you know, that was before Brexit. Um, I don't know what it would be now. Um, and uh, then some, some, uh, a bit of work on the machine to put a motor on and a, and a, and, uh, and you stand on it. Um, but it's amazing to, to get these old machines in. And um, um, it was a mystery why uh, I couldn't find any of these types of uh, grain cleaners, um, grain separators in the UK. I mean, what, what was, what I, maybe Peter has an idea for afterwards, but I don't know what farmers were doing to separate vetch out because it's also something that grows natively in the UK. So that's a mystery to me. But in France, they still got, you know, a lot of these old pieces of kit and all the peasant bakers are using these pieces of kit. Um, and then, yeah, once we had that machine, then we could, um, yeah, we could separate the vetch out and uh, we could, we could mill the, the wheat. Um, if it's got too much vetch in it, then it's, you know, it's, it can be pretty pungent, uh, the flavor of vetch, I can tell you so. Um, and it also inhibits fermentation to a degree as well, um, although it does add a bit of protein. But um, um, so that was a particular hurdle that we had to overcome. And um, I don't see a solution to that on a, on a larger scale. If people want to um, start peasant bakeries, I would still tell them to go to France and try and find a secondhand um, Maro, Maro, M-A-R-O-T is the name of the make, Maro Cleaner. Interestingly, the design of those, those separators hasn't really moved on a great deal. Uh, and they're just bigger and faster now. They still make them with a huge, huge tonnage output, you know, uh, compared to, I think it was 50 kilos an hour or so that we would get out of this uh, in terms of clean grain. And they do break down, you know, uh, the cog snapped once and we had to get it heat welded back again. And all the production stopped, you know, when that happened because we couldn't have any milling quality grain. So your heart's in your mouth sometimes. And, you know, I'm not an engineer, so um, you become reliant on people and you make friends with people. Who, uh, who were able to fix these things. Um, yeah, so um, it, otherwise, um, you know, the drying is the other issue if you're on a smaller scale. And again, we managed to buy a small scale dryer for drying seed, seed quantities. Um, uh, there, we found that there was an issue also with the drying. Um, well, well uh, the local farmer had a dryer we could use as, as kind of like a um, 12 ton batch gas dryer that most of you probably be familiar with. Um, actually, uh, it does harm germination. So I tend to find that the germination drops to about 75% in these. And I was talking to Josiah from Holman Dodds about it. And uh, yeah, it does cause, cause small fissures in the, in, the, in the grain. And eventually the, the wheat germ would die off. So if you were planting that seed straight after drying, germination might even be a bit higher. But once it's been in the, in the storage for a bit, it tends to drop off. So being able to dry the wheat in a sensitive way with these old grains um, is something that would we'd like to improve, you know, slightly as well. But um, yeah, that gives you a flavour. Seven minutes already, so um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rupert. Um, yeah, I just think it's such a neat, neat model that you had at the bakery um, or at Tordy Tier, and I think that's it's it's easily replicable. Um, which is one I, I want to come back to in discussion as well, because Emma mentioned the other day that we need um, models which are replicable, not scalable. Um, so, yeah, I would love to come back to that in the discussion. And Adam, um, you co you've co-founded Wild Press to support farmers growing apples in a way which supports soil health and biodiversity. Uh, can you tell us more about your sourcing and processing model and share some of the issues you've seen in fruit supply chains in the UK? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jess. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Jess said, I'm I'm Adam from from Wild Press, um, and thank you, Rupert. It was really interesting to hear uh, how the French grain producers are growing multi-variety heritage grains, and there's a real similarity to what we're finding in apples, and how that makes for a more resilient product. Um, so yeah, there's lots of similarities. Um, but a little intro to us. So after running a design studio and working a lot with restaurants and food brands. Uh, Nadine, my business partner, and I decided a couple of years ago we wanted to get a little closer to agriculture. 
um, and find a locally grown uh, or produced food product that through its very existence uh, could help restore and rebalance nature in the countryside. We um, quickly stumbled across heritage apples um, and all of their weird and wonderful names. Uh, we, we found Worcester's William Crump, uh, the, the Cumbrian Carlisle Codlin. Um, they all had colourful local histories and, and, and very importantly to us, really amazing flavours. So we just found there was so much culture, there was so much nuance that was wrapped up in them. Uh, it really got us excited and interested in, in, in the opportunities and the impact uh, and also the great flavor that a, that, a, that a juice company working with this product could, could, could make or could have. Um, sadly, these less known varieties have largely been in decline. Um, customers favoring sweeter, shinier, sleeker supermarket cousins, as it were. Um, and in a given year, anywhere from half a million tons uh, to two to three billion fresh apples could be imported from elsewhere in the world, um, while around 16 million British grown apples could be left to rot on the, on the orchard floor in varying years. Um, but at least gives you a benchmark of sort of the importing versus the wastage. Um, over, over the years that we found or we've seen that this, this buying trend has had the largest impact on the smallest and the oldest orchards. Um, those that are growing the, the less popular heritage varieties um, and they also couldn't keep up with the demand or offer the consistency that the supermarkets required. Um, so in many cases, uh, and we're talking over the last over the last 50 years or so, this this left farmers with little choice but to grub up the trees and plant something else that was that would be more profitable for them. Um, according to the People's Trust for Endangered Species, 90% of our British traditional orchards have been lost since the 1950s, uh, and 45% of the remaining English orchards are in declining condition. Uh, now, by declining condition, they're sort of a little wild, uh, a little, little sort of crazy around the edges, hence the brand name Wild Press. Um, but simply, they're just in need of a bit of TLC. They will, as, as we've seen with some, some restoration projects that we're supporting, they bounce back. They bounce back very quickly. Um, there are over 35,000 of these traditional orchards in the UK, um, and they provide a, a really amazing safe haven for bird, bees, uh, and, and all sorts of native, native wildlife. Um, their orchards are, are called, called a mosaic habitat uh, or sort of a mixed habitat. So it's part meadow, part woodland, part pasture, part hedgerow. If you picture an orchard, you can, or, or sort of an older orchard, you can see exactly what I mean. Um, but this is, this is amazing for the wildlife. So uh, as we're all aware, this, this, this native wildlife and biodiversity is also sadly in decline. Um, 41% according to the State of Nature report back in 2019. Um, so we as in Wild Press realized that protecting and restoring these orchards um, could play a role in reversing this decline. Um, so that's when we started seeking them out. Um, and that was sort of where the, where the journey really, or the, the story really got going, um, seeking, out these, seeking out these orchards all over the country. Last year, we worked with four, uh, including two biodynamic for farms. Um, that's Waltham Place in Berkshire, so not a million miles away from, from me here in Bucks, um, and Shire Farm up in Lincolnshire. Um, this year, we pressed a total of 18 different blends and single varieties, which we'll be launching soon. Um, and these are from a further four orchards, including the, the four from last year. Uh, these included Ed Jefferson's Organic Farm um, in Herefordshire, Riverford Farm, as, I was, as Peter was mentioning, um, down, in, down, in, down in Devon. Um, that's with, with Will Watson. Um, and Duncan and Sally Smalls. Uh, they have a traditional orchard in Somerset, which we're also mm. doing a lot of work with. Um, now that that's only that's only eight out of thirty-five thousand, and uh, and of those eight, we picked less than ten percent of their fruit last year. So as far as we're concerned, for as as wild press, there's a huge amount of room room for growth, and it, and we're really excited to work with even smaller orchards. Um, when we first started, uh, one of the major problems that we found with orchards, um, and when we first started this journey, we were staggered by the market price uh, for the fruit. Uh, just 18 pence a kilo was the going rate for juicing apples, which barely covers the cost of picking, um, let alone the cost of any nutritious soil treatments or natural pest deterrents. 
Um, so for many, it was a real major barrier um, to um, prevented the orchard owners from practicing more sustainably or certifying. Um, that's why this year uh, at WildPress, we've made the decision to pay a higher, fairer price um, and to create a sort of sliding scale, depending on what sustainable practices you're, you're applying to your land. Um, we're paying up to 85 pence per kilogram for biodynamic fruit and up to 50 pence per kilogram for organic juicing fruit. Um, and we've already found this pay structure in place and only after two seasons, our orchards have planted over 200 heritage trees um, and one farm has been incentivized to begin using solely organic practices on a large section of their orchard. So, so the impact is already sort of in motion and taking place. Um, for us, is, this is a, a regenerative model, um, enabling the growers to invest in the trees, to invest in the land, to invest in the soil, which as we all know is, is great, great for the planet and for nature. Um, and, and as far as we're concerned in terms of juice, it, it really makes for tastier fruit and, and, and the products better as a result. So as far as we're concerned, every, everybody sort of wins. Um, we also help to share knowledge across the network, across the community, um, because for us, we're not in the same position as Emma, where we're sort of impacted or we have to be impacted by the global market prices for apples. Um, we can create a sort of a local, a local price, um, but for us, it's not about creating competition. Uh, the more healthy orchards there are, that we can work with, the more bottles that we can press, the more fruits, the fruit that we can press, the better. Um, so onto sort of the resilience point. So how is our supply chain resilient? Um, we, key for us is to make sure that we're geographically spread um, and we keep the chains as short and flexible and as transparent as possible. Um, we've got a highly seasonal product um, with a very short processing window uh, just between September and November. So we store, we saw a few apples, but it, it, we, we find that it dries the fruit out a little bit. So when it comes to juicing, we get lower yield. So for us, we know we've got this very small window in the year to, to make the most of. So we need to be in direct contact with the growers in the summer. We go and visit them in the spring. So we get an idea of what varieties they've got. We taste the fruit from last year. We go at the end of summer, we taste them early season. Um, and we also get a steer on what varieties and what their yields are looking like year on year. We then have the luxury uh, with our model to be able to, uh, to adapt with a seasonal harvest, um, to account for different counties. You might have an on or an off year. Um, apples tend to have a bumper year every three years. So we're able to sort of work with those cycles. Um, supermarkets and bigger brands, they, they, can't, they can't adapt or flex like this. Uh, what we found sort of anecdotally, they need a really cheap, really consistent um, supply. Uh, and they often aim to replicate flavor or recipe year on year. Um, so as a result, they import a huge amount, especially when the UK has an off year because their supply chains aren't linked to these smaller producers as we are. Um, so, so yeah, they, they import a lot. Um, and in some cases, they'll even label under the guise of entirely made or grown in the UK, despite that not necessarily being the case. Um, Back to Wild Press. So after picking, we send hauliers out to the different counties. So sort of the logistics challenge is another, another sort of nuance of, of the supply chain. Um, we have to fill them up as best we can. So we try and send them out to counties and capture, capture orchards within an area. Um, and then we bring them back separated by variety and by orchard to our press in Buckinghamshire. Um, now then, depending on the yield, uh, we either craft orchard blends if, if, if it's a low yield, um, or if we're lucky and it's a good year, we can separate by single varieties. So we might have some amazing Adams pear name from Lincolnshire, which will separate out and create a single variety. Um, then we also have the opportunity to link these up with some of the cafes, restaurants and retailers that we work with. Um, and we can produce exclusive collaboration presses for them. So Wild Press, Times, whoever it might be. Um, this ties that retailer or the cafe or the restaurant directly to that orchard. Um, it aligns them with the positive impact and the sustainable, sustainable practices that, that orchard is applying. Um, and we've got a couple of these that we're really excited to announce, one of which, which, we'll, which we'll launch in the next couple of weeks.
Then our juices are pressed into glass bottles. We apply labels made from sugarcane waste um, and send them out in fully compostable boxes. Um, our mix cases go direct to consumer. Um, so of the 18 presses that we've pressed this year from a number of different orchards all over the country, uh, you'll find those in our mix cases. Um, and our trade cases go out to restaurants, bars and cafes, um, all from Aylesbury, which if you, if you know the area, isn't a million miles, miles away down the road, it's just about 20 minutes down the road. So sort of to capture all of that for us, um, building direct long term relationships with our producers is really important. Uh, keeping things local, keeping things sustainable um, is also really important. Um, and we're lucky enough to be riding uh, a non-alcoholic drinks wave. Um, and statistically, consumers are spending more and more money on organic produce. Um, so for us, for us, we're, yeah, we've got, there's a lot of excitement there. We're really, we, we feel that we're in an exciting moment, but crucially for us, every bottle that we sell, um, we support local wildlife and with any luck, uh, help reverse the biodiversity decline because that's, that's ultimately why we're here. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, yeah, I think what you're really highlighting for me is that it just really doesn't make sense that we're importing so much when things can be grown in the UK. And so I love what you're doing and you're just solving this huge kind of distribution problem um, through a very simple model. Um, just to highlight one of the figures that you mentioned before, you said that 16 million apples are waste, 16 million, is it 16 million? 16 million apples, yeah. Million apples wasted in the UK each year. And yet we're importing 476,000 tons of apples. So it just doesn't make any sense. Um, Yes. Yeah, which, 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 equates, which equates to two to three billion apples. So, I mean, huge, huge, huge numbers, but clearly we need to fix this broken supply chain um, in order to have less reliance or just to be able to make the most of, a, of, of what we have as a British crop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so we've heard a lot of different perspectives from various areas of the supply chain. Um, and although the end products are varying, the same problems are being encountered. So I'd just like to start to delve into some of the questions to, to look at those problems in more detail. Um, firstly, I just want to look at um, Peter. We mentioned, or we spoke the other day about needing to rethink the whole system. So what disruptive routes to market can smaller processes make and what financial benefit is associated to these, these new models? I think if we start with financial benefit first, and it's cropped up across all of the different discussions, hasn't it? But I think uh, Adam is talking about price and it has to be related, first of all, to the actual costs of production. So our focus is very much on those family farms who, in many cases, have generations of wisdom handed down to them about how to produce a wholesome food product, but without inputs. And so often the costs of production can be um, focused on as being much lower than they need to be by stripping out so many of the inputs that are supplied by these big global links in the supply chain that Emma was talking about and that Adam has talked about. So it's a case of, of working directly with those small producers, establishing what is a good low input, simple method of production at the right price. We then know we have something of real value to bring to the market. So the disruption, first of all, depends on links with those, uh, those smaller producers with real integrity. Then we have to bypass what again, Emma has talked about the big structures that have been set up to support a global supply trade in, in fiber, all of this huge trade in apples around the world. It's just the same with meat. So the disruption, if you like, is going back to the future. 
We're just saying it is small producers. We need all those small links in the local network. It's a collaboration of smaller scale businesses. And actually Rupert referred to the, he needs a damn good mechanic if, if his um, cleaning machine breaks, he needs the mechanic. And this is the point historically the food system and farming system was integrated with many, many small local businesses, all of whom have different skills. But that needs to be the structure. So the small abattoir, for example, is a critical link for meat supply. And so if and just like uh, Adam has been describing with different varieties, we're not talking huge quantities. We're not talking killing a thousand lambs in a day. It might be killing a hundred lambs and that might be from four or five different suppliers. So the smaller scale traditional processes are effectively the way forward. It's rebuilding this functional local supply structure. And yes, it's massively disruptive to these big globalized corporate structures that have put huge pressure on the smaller producers and the smaller processes. So our vision is very much go back to respect and harness the enormous value of those multiple small businesses within localized regions. And we can come on to it a bit later if you like, but the mobile abattoir, for example, is one way of filling in the gaps that have built up. And just like Emma says, you know, the, the processes are so widespread now and they're giant. We need to really have a clear vision about going back to multiple smaller scale localized processes that will then nourish the incredible resource of those smaller scale family farms who like Adam has talked about, they are the guardians of biodiversity and nurturing soil biology, which should be the absolute foundation stone of everything we put in our mouths. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, Emma, do you want to jump in on that question? Yeah, I mean, we kind of we're thinking very much in parallel. I think <clears throat> um, the really important thing to remember is that I think people find it very hard to think about fibres and fashion without thinking about um, you know fast fashion and the high street and how can any new system that we create possibly kind of be able to take to take over or provide an alternative to what's currently happening. But one of the most disruptive things about Fibre Shed is that actually it's asking us to completely reimagine fashion. Some people would call it post-fashion in that it's um, asking us to think about fashion as defined by our local resource base or resource landscape, rather than something that's defined or dictated by designers, by brands, by trendsetters or influencers. So thinking about it like that, um, the small mills start to play a really important role because they're the ones that can help a farmer or a producer to understand what their fiber is and how best to process it to make the most of it. Um, they really kind of create a bridge between um, farmers and manufacturers, helping farms to, to understand their fiber and improve it over time. Um, and also to help the manufacturer understand what this resource is and, and how to make the most of it when it's being made into a garment. Um, one of the strengths, so I was interested on the regenerative fashion session yesterday. Um, one of the big strengths of British wool as an institution is that 80% of its wool producers live within one hour of their local wool depot. That's 80% of 35,000 producers. Unfortunately, we're a long way off having anything like that with our processing infrastructure. Currently, um, uh, around three quarters of our processing is concentrated in just two geographical regions, primarily Yorkshire and the Humber, uh, and then a little bit in the Southwest. Um, so really we do exactly as Peter says, we want to be working towards a model of um, 
production or a new infrastructure that sees much more decentralized processing facilities that are accessible to more producers. And if we could fix this, then we could be producing garments pretty much within region for the region, um, which also see the producers being able to capture a much larger share of the final value. Great, thanks so much, Emma. Um, and Adam, you you guys are creating quite a disruptive route, route to market because you're going di direct to consumer, similarly to Pipers. Um, can you talk a bit about a bit more about these disruptive routes to market that we can um, start to look at? Yeah. So I mean, for us, for us launching in the middle of the pandemic, it was a no it was a no brainer for us to go direct to consumer. Um, as a uh, as as I mentioned, we 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 started or we we still have a design studio, um, working with lots of restaurants, bars, food brands, and we sort of anticipated when we launched that was going to be our primary route to market. We were going to be focused on the on trade, um, but as it transpired, we sort of um, with lockdown after lockdown, we had to pivot. Um, we changed the design a little bit. We sort of softened up the language a little bit. We made it less sort of, uh, Peter and I were just, just talking about, we could very much go down the wine route, talking about terroir, provenance. Um, but we, we sort of reined that back a little bit and created a more retail ready product. Um, so we launched with a, with a mixture of direct consumer, um, focusing on the mixed cases because for us, uh, the idea of being able to sample all of these different varieties from all of these different orchards that's that's part of the excitement so a bit like naked naked wines with their with their mixed cases um we were sort of tapping into that but from a non-alcoholic uh, option so we launched with that then as things started to open up um we had the opportunity to reach out to some of our restaurant restaurant clients and restaurant contacts so we were really lucky to have some Keystone Keystone launch clients. So we're, you can find us in Ottolenghi's restaurants. You can find us in Sky Gingles Spring um, in Somerset House. Um, and then lining that up or off the back of that, then we we're able to ac access the whole wholesale market for retail um, and for sort of wider restaurants, bars on trade. Um, in terms of the there are lots of merits some of them some of them financial some of them some of them a little more nuanced but sort of you obviously get great exposure from 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 the, from the restaurants and, and 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 good marketing opportunity um we um the wholesalers give us give us access to uh to the national market direct consumer is great for, for great for margins uh for us and also then obviously that that feeds back to the farms um and I guess the other key thing of the direct consumer is we're able to build direct relationships with our customers. Um, whereas with the restaurants, you'll never see that glass on the table. You'll never be able to talk to that person and say, how are you finding that? How does Adam's Pearmain from Somerset compare to Adam's Pearmain in Lincolnshire? We just don't have that opportunity for, 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 for sort of information sharing and feedback, um, which is also great. I mean, just as, uh, just as, uh, just as Emma was saying, like to be able to feed back and, and Peter to be able to feed back to the producers and to say people are loving this variety. Um, people are loving it when we mention what sustainable practices you're applying to your soil. Do more of that and it'll enable us to A, pay you more and B, to be able to like put that on the bottle, which is really exciting people. So all of that, all of that sort of feedback loop is much, much better linked up um, with a direct consumer model. Um, and moving forward, we'd like to explore a, a sort of farmer's market style, maybe not on a farmer's market pitch, as it were, but a farmer's market style sort of events pop up uh, that might enable us to take on some sort of smaller unused retail sites in, in, in towns, towns and cities. Um, refill stations are something that we'd like to explore. How can we how can we cut out that um, pack the the bottling the bottling and the labeling side is a, is a, is quite an arduous, costly, complicated process for us. Um, so is there opportunity for people to take that bottle? We're serving our serving our juices in champagne bottles. So a to elevate the product, but it's a it's it's a good amount of glass. Like you really 
shouldn't be throwing that in the recycling after just getting through a bottle of juice. So how can we integrate a bit of a refill model um, with a very short shelf life, obviously, because we wouldn't have the sterilization or the pasteurization opportunity. Um, and linked to that, how can we explore sort of local juice on tap? How can we go to a bar or to a pub or to a restaurant and say, there's an orchard just down the road. We're gonna, we're gonna put their juice into a, a bag in a box style, uh, style product and we'll market that that you can then serve to it through a, through a chilled chilled pump. Maybe we could put them into, ke into kegs that will sit below the bar. Um, so just again, we can tap into or sort of have an eye on that, on, on those alcohol products, be it, be it craft beer or wine. Um, and we can sort of just bring some non-alcoholic products and, 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 and just emulate some of the serves. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, yeah, so it sounds like there's like a lot of benefits about this direct to consumer model and norm more disruptive routes to market. Um, one of the other problems that I'm aware of for more small scale processes is that they can't, they can't compete within the current system of certification and regulation requirements. Um, so a lot of multiple retailers will require that suppliers have BRC certification, for example. Um, Peter, could you just give us a bit more information about how smaller processes could get around the obstacle of requiring certification, um, such as BRC or licensing for small abattoirs? Thanks, Jess. I, I think um, these certifications are part of the structure which has been built around large corporate globalized trade they need cert they are the ones that need the certification the producers definitely don't but there's been a a a sort of a trap a vortex which has sucked in so much of the supply chain into this trap which is saying we small producers have got to jump through all of these hoops to satisfy what it is that the big globalized uh, retail structures would like us to have. So my view is we need to have a vision of something where they are of no consequence. We go back to, I, I was just so interested to hear Adam talking about going into an unused high street property, for example, and there's quite a few of them at the moment to serve a local product to a local market. You don't need huge schemes of um, certification. That is a direct relationship between the producer and the consumer. And it is constantly being audited and certified because if the product isn't good, that consumer simply doesn't come back. It's not complicated, but it is hard-nosed commercial reality that you know, the marketplace, a functional marketplace of multiple small producers and multiple small consumers does not need huge layers of bureaucracy and certification. And so I would just say, let us imagine and let us be really confident about a future which looks radically different from the current status quo of big players in dysfunctional markets and big regulator. And I would say we can really genuinely envisage that future because of a digitalized landscape we have that tool to create real commercial efficiency and it's critical we cannot expect consumers to pay a premium they can only pay for something that represents good value good wholesome product whether it's fiber or whether it's food produced locally and sold directly to the final consumer across a short supply chain almost inevitably represents good value. The customer should not be expected to pay for a layer of regulation which contributes nothing whatsoever to the traditional process 
of resilient local supply relationships that have real integrity, not just simply a piece of paper. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I love that idea of imagining a future which looks radically different. Um, and the idea you mentioned earlier about going back to the future. Um, and yeah, I think we, like you said, we need to reimagine every part along the whole chain. So new, new routes to market, new models of people collaborating together to set up these small processing hubs. Um, so I'd like to just go into that a bit more about thinking about what models could, could be created and what, what, mo what models might, might work um, to, to set up these new processing, pr processing hubs. Um, Rupert, do you think you could jump, jump in on that? I know you've got yeah, sure. So, um, you know, yeah. as part of my relationships we've got in France, um, with regards to starting, um, you know, Tour Fortier, um, they're, they're quite, quite a way ahead of us over there in terms of their networks and their cooperatives. So obviously, yeah, co cooperation is, is rather than, um, yeah, rather than competition is a sort of key, key paradigm shift, isn't it? And, um, um, and also, I, I wanted to mention that we've got, you know, we've got um, the, the question of, um, of standardization of products, um, but there's also certification. And I think it's a certification issue as well, um, where certification of products is very, very centralized. Um, um, and if that, that relates to how, how far we're sending a product, isn't it, as well? So what if we could regionalize certification? Um, so each region decided, uh, or bioregion decided exactly, you know, what standards they want to put on their, on their products um, and how that's produced and what their story is and what those relationships are. Um, and um, again, in the UK, uh, we're a bit behind on this, but there's a, there's a system called participatory guarantee system. So if you look that up on the iPhone website, then there's some good resources on that. Um, but again, in France and other countries, producers and consumers are coming together and they're looking at processing together as well um, to, to, just, to collectively decide how, how they want to have their relationships and, and what sort of standards they want to keep on their, on, their, on their products. And then you can, there's far more flexibility and diversity in, in our stories and how we produce things. Um, one example um, in France is uh, Triptolem. I'm just trying to look it up to give you a, give you a link. Um, uh, they're based across um, the sort of, um, Brittany region, um, and um, they uh, every year. It's not just a one-off project. Um, um, have uh, you know research uh, with with uh, with researchers, farmers, and consumers um, on uh, cereal varieties, um, and um, people come together once a year to taste those varieties and score them, and um, and uh, it's just an ongoing set of relationships and. Um, um, every year rather than one-off projects and I think again we need to yeah you know have those relationships going on a constant basis um, to keep evolving um, how we're uh, adapting varieties and breeds and things to our local regions and what the story is on the end product of that as well for local people um, so yeah Triptolem again in Francis I'll, I'll find a link and send it in the chat as well um, but yeah I wanted to add a few thoughts on that thank you so much Rupert um, yeah, I, there was a talk yesterday as well, um, the Cooperation in Wales talk, where they're starting to look at these cooperative models. Um, and it just sounds like that's, it makes most sense. And we, it sounds like we're quite behind in the UK. Um, and if we come together, then we can start to distribute funding, resources, knowledge and skills. Um, it just doesn't make sense to be doing this individually in different areas of the country on our own. I think we really need to start to group together. So I'm quite excited that these conversations are starting to happen, like the project that they've been doing in Wales. Um, it feels like they're starting to, it's starting to gain momentum in the UK, basically. Um, and just jumping ahead and given the context of time that we're in, we've just been in a two year COVID crisis and faced with the climate crisis. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've seen, and I think we'll see more, how fragile complex supply chains are um, because they're reliant on large scale globalised supply chains. Do you think that we have the ability to supply the UK market and create a more localised resilient system if processing was accessible to farmers and producers? Um, 
Peter, would you like to jump in there? Yeah, I, I think the short answer to that, Jess, is yes. I mean, I, I think the bigger picture, they might say something like we are, um, we would like to be 60% self-sufficient as a country if we're talking of food, but I think it equally applies to, to fibre. Um, as um, Emma was describing earlier, the idea of exporting hundreds of thousands of tonnes of wool to China to be processed and have um, man-made fibres added to it and then sent back. It, it, these trading uh, structures that have been established are very, very inefficient. They make no sense. So I believe we should look regionally at what this country is capable of producing. We should be growing fruit and vegetables. We should be optimizing the use of all the resources and that's the natural land resource as the starting point. And I have absolutely no doubt we could empower a new generation of young farmers to work with nature, work with the, the farmed landscape to produce, and I don't know what the actual percentage of food or fiber would be and in terms of the UK domestic market. But all I know is that one of the things which would come with that is a massively greater respect for the value, A, of the people who've done the work to produce it and B, of the products themselves. And am I not right, something like a third of all farmed produce globally currently is wasted, either in the transportation or in just the processing. The small localized processing structures we've been talking about today, there will be no waste. I bet none of Rupert's bread or dough gets wasted. The same with Adam's uh, fruit juice. It's the same with our products. We know our customers really respect and value every part of the product. So the answer is definitely the sorts of visions we're talking about is the way to be much more self-sufficient as a country and regionally, there is just much more focus on what we can do with our natural resources. Thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, and Emma, you mentioned earlier that we are exporting a lot of our wool to be blended and, and re-importing it um, with, um, what's it called? <laughs> the artificial fibers. Um, do you think that we have the capabilities to, um, to supply the UK market with wool rather than importing? I do. I mean, the exact figures, again, we don't have. We've just finished the first phase of a feasibility study into homegrown fibres and fashion um, project. That first phase was the mapping of our processing infrastructure, but the subsequent phases, which um, it looks like we might have funding for later this year, would investigate both what the current market demand is for homegrown fibres um, and what our production capacity is, both existing and potential. So we'd hope to be able to kind of to, to join those dots. Um, I'm really glad Peter used the word optimization because when it, when it comes to fibers, there are ways in which we could be optimizing crops and commodities that are being grown for two purposes, to be dual purpose. Um, there's a lot that could be done to support farmers in um, rearing sheep to give a valuable fleece so they're not valuable just for meat but also for good fiber that's something that's been lost in the last 50 60 years when um, a lot of our livestock production was focused on um, meat yields after the second world war um, same goes for plant fibers we grow hemp for seed and oil we go we grow flax for seed and oil and there is work currently being done into how we could also use the stalk, which is currently a, a byproduct, how that could be optimized for use as fiber so that we can really be clever um, in, the, in, our, in, in how we're using commodities um, in the land and space that we have in the UK. 
Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, so just imagining that we do start to have these models where, the, where, where farmers and um, businesses start to collaborate or we have cooperative models, what kind of um, setup costs are required and what kind of resources and knowledge and skills are required um, to start to set up models like that? Um, who wants to go? Adam, do you want to jump in? Um, so, so yeah, uh, for us, we're, uh, we, we, we have a partner pressing, um, pressing company in Buckinghamshire. So for us, uh, those, those setup, setup costs, um, aren't, aren't, aren't there for us. Um, but just to go back to your, to your, to, to, to your previous point, I think it was really interesting what, what the guys were talking about, the craziness of imports and exports, or well, we're, what we're finding in, 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 in apple juice, um, there's 1.6 billion pounds that's spent spent on juice uh, in the UK, um, and of that, 63% of those sales are orange juice. Um, orange juice is obviously entirely imported, um, and we just need to change that picture of sort of what juice goes with your breakfast, um, or what juice you can enjoy in the afternoon. Um, so. I mean, for us, it's just thinking about the number of trees that could be planted, the local economies that could be created, the air miles that could be cut, not having to ship oranges from Florida over, over to the UK, um, and also the biodiversity that, that, that could be boosted. But, um, but yeah, some of the other guys might, might be better to talk about models and processing setups and that sort of stuff. Thank, thanks, Adam. Yeah, Peter, could you maybe give some, some more insight into the mobile abattoir? Yeah, and also just to pick up on the point that Adam has just made about they've got up and running pretty quickly um, using a partner who is an established pressing operation. And I think that is really crucial here. We don't all need to be master of everything. I think it is about building collaborative structures. People specialize in particular parts of the process. And with meat, that's particularly important. And okay, we're talking about rolling back some of the crazy capital cost, which has been attached to all this inappropriate regulation. And that's been particularly bad in the meat sector. So let's hope we start to roll that back. But even so, the most resilient way to build functional local supply chains is by a collaboration of smaller scale local businesses, all of whom bring a different skill set to the partnership. So the, the sum of the parts leads to a much more productive and cost effective whole. And in terms of the mobile abattoir, we see it as being a business, for example, run by two people who make their job of being flexible, of being mobile and efficiently killing a day's kill that can be supplied into local food, you know, changed into local processes. So it's all about making commercial pieces of separate businesses collaborate together to make a really sustainable, resilient whole. Thanks, Peter. And could you give any insight into what kind of setup costs um, someone uh, wanting to replicate the model would be looking at? I think the secret is not to go too far in terms of stretching yourself uh, with capital investment. So like Adam has done, find somebody locally who does a step who's already got established resources. And like Emma referred to, and, and what I, the point I've made earlier, we must all be focused on optimizing the best use of our resources within local supply chains. It doesn't make any sense for people to overstretch themselves and overcommit capital, because that is a fundamental weakness in the business model. Mm -hmm. Um, and Rupert, what about at your bakery? What kind of setup costs were, were required there? I know you mentioned the six hundred pound machine, um, and then that you borrowed some. So were there quite low setup costs, which would be easy for other people to to replicate that that model? 
I mean, low is relatively speaking, depending on your resources or scale, isn't it? So two grand could be a lot for a community group, you know, so. Um, but yeah, the the, um, the indented cylinder cleaner ended up probably costing about two grand by the time we paid for it, imported it um, and uh, fixed it up with a motor, etc. cetera, um, which is amazing value really for what it does um, for transforming grain into a millable, uh, uh, you know, harvest into a millable grain. Um, and the other tray cleaner we bought secondhand for about um, three and a half thousand, um, but that was probably a bigger scale machine than we needed, to be honest, uh, but that was what was available secondhand. Um, so those are the two cleaners. And then for the dryers, most farmers tend to have a gas gas dryer that you could use, um, but we bought a secondhand dryer not long ago for um, uh, 500 quid um, and you can get them, they're not made anymore, but um, they kind of look like a sort of trailer with a perforated bottom and a blower underneath. And you can fit a gas burner on those because you don't want to put a diesel blower on grain if it's for milling. Um, then um, yeah, so that was great value as well for a small scale dryer. And those, um, yeah, those are the, or you can build a dryer yourself out of old potato boxes and some pipes and a, and a, and a blower and stuff like that as well. You can, you can do things like that as well. Um, but those, those are some basic setup costs in terms of processing for us. Great, thanks. Thanks, Rupert. And has anyone got any idea of funding? Like what funding um, channels can people look to to, to set up processing? I, I think there are definitely funding streams and, and local enterprise partnerships and so on. But often, I think there's a danger, there's a caveat with them. You do not want to have the tail wagging the dog. Don't start to jump through hoops because funders have said that's what you need to do. Keep things simple. Look around in the local economy of entrepreneurs, of small businesses, seek support and collaboration within that network before you go out to look for funding because that can definitely as i say be the tail that wags the dog and and don't go there yeah i'd agree with peter entirely i'd say uh, relationships are, are as valuable as money so um um but in that sense think about fundraising that also builds relationships with your community so I would say first port of call is to look at some sort of crowdfunding or share issue structure rather than um, centralized funder. But then there are some central funders that that really support well, that process. The A-Team Foundation being one um, that really like to work with food. Um, we got some uh, some also some funding to create employment from the Coastal Communities Fund, um, which is Crown Estate money, um, coastal areas in, in the UK. I think that's still going, I think. Um, <laughs> And that was very good level of funding for a relatively low level of employment that you had to create, but definitely got the feeling, like Peter said, that we were we had to hit our targets, and it adds a lot of pressure uh, mentally to to you if if you're the one you know or a group of you taking it on. So psychologically, it does add pressure, definitely. Um, but yeah, crowdfunding, you'll be amazed, even if you've never done it before. You've got to get way out of your comfort zone sometimes. But yeah, you know, it's a it's an amazing thing. You've got to put a huge amount of effort in. But for every pound that someone might donate or invest you've also created a relationship and that is what's hugely valuable because they might end up volunteering skills or time or end up buying whatever you're, what you're producing. So that's far more valuable for me. Thanks Rupert. Yeah, I think you're, I think you guys are totally right. It is just about coming together and collaborating and not trying to do everything too much at once. Um, on and also, yes, just to say that, you know, I think with regards to, um, you know, Tortia, the, there's some in, about uh, 10 or 11 investors who helped um, and with that there's no interest on that investment um, it can be converted into shares um, but also uh, if they wanted but also down the line I know Fordor Farm for instance they were said well when they got to the stage of being able to pay the investors back they said well actually we want to do this project and would you like to keep your money in because you know if you don't really need it back now and most people didn't then most people kept the money in and they did something else with it so they kind of doubled the investment by keeping it invested. And um, that's the sort of thing you can do with relationships with, with individual people as well. I was, I was just going to say, uh, Jess, one of the quotes from yesterday was change moves at the pace of trust. And all I would say is I think investors and money men like to drive change to their, from their perspective and to their agenda. And that's very different from the sort of thing Rupert has just described. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it's like rethinking the system, even in terms of funding, like every area. Um, are there any, before we go on to the, the Q&A, we've got a few questions, but before we jump into that, is there anything that any of the other speakers have highlighted that you want to question or find more information out about? Yeah, I mean, Emma, I just, um, I sent you a message earlier. Uh, we talk about regional uh, produce you know processing on way for scale for doing things but i just wanted to ask you the question in terms of textiles like uh, um what about yeah you know i was thinking of gandhi you know and the spinning wheel in people's houses and that's that sort of approach where it's really decentralizing how we could produce things and culturally making it part of people's lives again i don't know is that something that you've looked at or yeah i mean i, <laughs> I think a lot of us would end up very cold for a large portion of the year if, if there was the expectation that um, uh, kind of fiber textile garment production became that decentralized. But as Peter said, you know, it, it would have been historically not everybody necessarily would have known how to do that. Perhaps those in shepherding or farming communities, there may have been um, a lot of cultural knowledge there about how to process fibers, but not everybody in town. So again, I think it's, it's fair to think we still need a degree of specialization rather than be able to expect that everybody can do everything. Um, and with fibers and textiles and garments, we do have the challenge that uh, to make one garment from some raw fleece, it has to undergo many processes, which is lengthy. Uh, I might venture to say lengthier maybe than creating a loaf of bread from grain. Um, um, therefore, we're going to need um, some degree of specialization in those facilities for processing at least. Um, great, guys, so should we, we go into the Q&A? We've got quite a few questions to get through. Um, we've got one from Oliver saying, Peter, did you bump your head? Yeah, well, Ollie, yeah, sorry about that. I, um, I tripped up some steps and, and the steps won. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm on the mend, thank you. Great, thanks Peter. Um, and then to all panellists, how can localised supply chains play a key role in, de in delivering tangible change and benefits under this whole levelling up agenda in the UK? Big question, does anyone want to jump in there? Yeah, I'll jump in briefly. I, mean, I came, uh, had the idea for a while of, 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 of going back to the cooperatives idea, which is nothing new, right, how a cooperative works. Um, for instance, in Pembrokeshire, we've got a there's a farmers cooperative in Pembrokeshire, um, which sells uh, potatoes and other vegetables called puffin produce to supermarkets. But it's not agroecological at all. But it is a cooperative, and we need agroecological cooperatives um, that can do things on a, uh, as Peter's been describing. Um, and I think we need them to be both local, regional, national, and international. Um, and what I'm I think it's an interesting question for like, the future. Is what you know because we're always going to want to import and export some things. Um, is 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 in terms of how countries decide on you know the um, the regulations for these things. Actually, if you've got international cooperatives, um, um, which have, have got uh, you know members to those cooperatives, um, you know for instance, if if you're doing that on a local scale, um, and you, you know you might want to access some raw milk or something like that, um, then it means you're a private group of consumers, and I wonder how cooperatives, even on an international scale, might be able to, in the future, look at these sorts of questions um, for import and export. I think that's a really interesting one. I don't nothing about it, but just a question. Um, but I think we really need to link um, um, the standards of production, the local stories, to the processing, to the import and export, and I think, and the investment in those things. So I think the, co the cooperative model, whereby um, farmers and producers are supported by um, other people working on these things like marketing, distribution, um, collaboration and, and, and certification and things um, is, is the way to go because we need, need to think as holistically as possible. So yeah, just drop that in. Yeah, I think just to echo what you were saying about international cooperative models, I've been looking into that and um, I know that there's, there is ARLA that exists, which is an international co-op model. I don't know much about them, but um, there's an expert on international co-ops called Edgar Parnell. So I've got a call with him next week to find out more about how they would work. But I do think that 
when there is a possibility that farmers can start to work together internationally and there's I know that there's a big gap for distribution because at the moment most wholesale suppliers in the UK are supplying from co big commodities brokers with very little transparency so I'm quite interested to look more into this co-op model and to maybe look at a model where the profit from a distribution company, for example, could be fed back into farmers setting up processing hubs. So it's like this circular, circular cycle of profit being regenerated to start to create these little hubs of processing. Um, has anyone else got any, got any input? Uh, in I, one quick point, Jess. I think it is really important that central government and the regulators if they're talking about levelling up, they really have got to understand the vision for a relocalised functional supply chains. And they cannot have regulation which is fixated with global trade, for example, and start adding hurdles to local entrepreneurship. You know, if the market, real market demand exists, businesses will establish to, to fulfil that demand. And they're just, it's crazy that that should be interfered with by this concept that everything must be weighed down by the requirements of globalized certification or regulations or something like that. So, yeah, relocalize, re regionalize structures of, of regulation, if you like. But you know, that's, we need everybody to buy into that holistic vision that. Rupert talks about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Peter. Um, just jumping on to the next question from Tony Little, who was on the um, co cooperation talk on um, in Wales yesterday. He says, I think one of the problems with wool is high cost, small scale primary processing, especially sourcing. A while ago now, but when I looked at this in Wales in 2014, it was about £1.30 per kilo for raw fleece for small scale versus 29p per kilo in large scale processing in Bradford. So he's interested to hear how we can find the right scale that allows processing to work more economically. Has anyone got anything? Yeah, I think, well, <laughs> I think he's certainly right. He's mentioned there two kind of very opposite ends of the scale. Hi, Tony, if you're still on. Um, uh, and vastly different. We've got mills that process one fleece at a time, and we have mills that process eight tons at a time. And we do have mills that kind of sit somewhere comfortably in between that can do anything from kind of 10 to 15 kilos up to a couple of hundred. So it's within that kind of threshold that most small producers are using. We just don't have very many of those mills, and that's the problem. Um, I think it's also worth kind of emphasizing that we're never going to be going to be able to produce to the volume that current high street does and nor do we want to that's inherently unsustainable both in volume of production and volume of waste and hand in hand with thinking about a new processing infrastructure we also need to be thinking about how to re-educate um, consumers about the value and the true cost of what we're wearing um, and get beyond the idea of renewing a wardrobe every season or every year and um, I think instead about pieces that are going to be heirlooms for the future. Has anyone else got any thoughts on that question? Thanks Emma. Yeah I'm just really interested Emma about your, men about your comment on value and rethinking value and getting customers to rethink value. Um, has anyone, Peter or Adam, have you got any thoughts on that idea of value and how we can change customers perception of it? Yeah, I, I think that's 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 key for us as well. Apple apple juice for, for many years has just been sort of on the supermarket shelves. It's made its way to uh, to, to to your fridge door. It's glugged from the bottle by 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 yourself or your kids. Um, and it hasn't been valued as a as a product. The nuances of that as a as a product haven't been teased out. You know, I mean, there hasn't been space for any education. People haven't been talking about different varieties, uh, seasonality, all, all, all of these things that the wine industry is sort of built around. Um, so for us, there's there's a there's a very gentle, slow build sort of education point that 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 we can that we are building into the Wild Press brand. 
to yeah just to enable to give people that option to if they want to spend a little bit more on on juice because maybe they're drinking less uh, or maybe they they want to they they want to support the smaller the smaller orchards just to just to sort of educate that making a bottle of juice isn't isn't a complicated or is a complicated process it's not it's not easy um and therefore there is a cost associated with that um so yeah for us like sort of ed education on on, on, on and, and and re education on, on value is important thanks adam um oh i think this one's a good one for a close for closing from jasmine black so we've spoken a lot about creating these kind of cooperative collaborative more regional processing models. Um, Jasmine says, what are the next steps to creating a clear vision or well-connected network to help set up and support more local infrastructure? Has anyone got any ideas on what the next steps are? I, I, I think it, it's the good old fashioned concept of, of enterprise and if you like free market, but there we know there is very, real demand from customers who, as Adam has just referred to, get this thing about value. It isn't simply about price. It is about really wanting to access products that they deem to be good value for money, whether that's a garment or whether it's a piece of food. The really exciting thing for us is people are beginning to make this association between what they put into their body as food and their health. So to deliver your health through what you purchase is the definition of good value in anybody's day-to-day -day life. So it's about taking the shackles off local enterprise because I think naturally that is going to rebuild these really functional local supply chains from the bottom up it's not going to come from the top down. Thanks, Peter. Has anyone else got any comments on what the next steps could be? Um, yeah, just to, I think there's two things. I think there's the market, like Peter was talking about, and I want to give a shout out to the Open Food Network here because I think their platform is a really great one for local food hubs. And, um, you know, before we left Wales, it was really going, starting to go strong there in St. David's. And, um, and you could see that producers were being brought together and relationships were being connected and people could see that there was a market for local products. And I think you can drive change from, like change can happen from there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I was thinking of when you were talking, Adam, of being in Lithuania in the autumn and, um, you know, you just, it, or, you, all the, the apples you're not going to keep for, for eating in the winter, you just bag them up and maybe the more blemish looking ones and take them to your local apple press and everybody seems to do it. Everyone's got apple press, everyone's got apple trees, does it. And there was one tagged onto a petrol station somewhere that was busy that time of year. And um, and then you just take your bags of apple juice home for the winter and that sort of thing. It's not really, um, that's not really a market for selling stuff, but it's about us becoming perhaps more peasant in our outlook in terms of our production and um, community orchards and home orchards doing that um, and uh, with other goods as well, right? So having processing that's available both for producers to sell stuff, but also for home producers to be preserving things for the winter or whatever. Thank you so much, Rupert. Um, we've got three minutes left. Has anyone got any closing thoughts or comments or ideas that could inspire people to take these ideas on further past this talk? I think don't hesitate to go out and see what actually goes on. There's, there's no substitute, as I think all of us have talked about earlier, of those connections with people who've got the experience. And quite apart from the the wound on my head. We've got plenty of t-shirts of lessons we've learned over 30 some years. And it is about building these connections. It's about relationships between local people. And that's going to be the seedbed for growing really functional local supply chains going forward. Thank you. Adam, have you got any closing thoughts? I think just remember that every every pound that you spend is like a sort of a token for change. Um, buying buying meat from from Peter's farm, buying Emma's Emma's cloth or Rupert's bread or our apple juice, like that's a that's a sig that's a signal to the government. That's a signal to everybody around you that you 
care about the welfare of animals. You care about uh, the, 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 the British wool. You, pe- you care about the heritage grains. Um, and that's, that's really, really important because the more people that make that signal, that, that put that token, token down, uh, the, more, the more people will listen in a, in a broader context. Thank you. And Emma? This might, might, might be a left field addition in the last second, but um, we're also now having conversations about how waste, when there is waste, how that waste can become a resource flow in itself and how we could be combining waste from all kinds of um, commodity streams, from agriculture, from domestic use, um, um, to be able to feed into new systems of production. Thank you. And Rupert, we've got one minute left. Yeah, no substitute for doing it is there. So um, there's thinking about it and there's doing it. So um, yeah, in my experience where where you you know where you don't think you can do something because there's a lack of uh, a, a, a finance or someone who can fix something or whatever it is, then you create a need. And by creating a need and going out there publicly with that need, it that's what forms community and forms uh, relationships that can carry things forward. So don't think that if you don't have everything in place, you can't do it. Just go out and then find a way to express to your local your community what what is needed, and then. And then if they value it, then then it can happen, right? Thank you so much, Rupert. And thank you all speakers. And just to remind everyone that after this session, you can um, continue the conversation in the community forum. Um, Thank you so much. It's really inspiring to hear all of you and all of your insight into different areas.